So thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for this very nice invitation in Bangalore. It's also my first time in Bangalore, and I am enjoying it, especially the nice weather that we don't have in Frankfurt. And uh, today, uh, I would like to continue on this high TC that we had this. Oh, we had this morning. We were uh, the talks were basically on the high TC cuprates. In my talk, I would like to go to a new class of high TC materials which are um, the iron-based uh, nictites and calcogenites. And um, since we are in a workshop of uh, dynamical mean field theory and the combination of density functional theory with dynamical mean field theory, I will be discussing here some results for these materials based on this combination of LDA plus DMFT. Um, this uh, work um, is a, col a collaboration between uh, some PhD students in Frankfurt, like Milan Tomic, uh, Stefan Backes and Daniel Guterding, Johannes Ferber, he was also a postdoc in Frankfurt, is now in Elsevier, and Katarina Foyevsova, also a former postdoc, now a, a former PhD student, now a postdoc in Vancouver. Harald Jeschke, he's a jun junior research scientist in my group, and I will be also showing some results we have been doing with Igor Mazin and with Rafael Fernandez regarding um, the effects of pressure on these uh, iron-based superconductors. And we are being funded by the German Science Foundation and by the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung. So um, following what um, Antoine George was saying yesterday that uh, the eras in, uh, in history are being named like <laughs> in a, taking the name of a compound or a metal, so um, I, we could, uh, in fact, consider 2008 uh, as the, in the framework of supercondu superconductivity as a new Iron Age, um, because uh, the, here, Cosono and his group, they found a new material which from structure looks very similar to the high TC cuprates. So we have layers of iron and arsenic separated by layers, in this case here, of, um, flu uh, of here oxygen and lanthanum. And um, the phase diagram that they found for this material looks also very similar to the high TC cuprates uh, with, uh, in fact, a fundamental difference. So you see we have a region for when the system is on dope for the parent compound the material is metallic at high temperatures. Going down in temperatures goes onto a um, structural phase transition from, ortho from um, here, the trigonal phase, to an orthorhombic phase. And then at low temperatures, it's still a metal but shows a spin density wave. So long range or the spin density wave. And this is the fundamental difference to the high physical cuprates where we have here that the systems are mod insulators. Now, doping the system in this case by substituting oxygen by fluor, so in this case we're giving electrons to the system, what, uh, what Hosono and collaborators found is that the system becomes superconductor at a critical temperature uh, of 26 K. So we have here um, a new class of materials which similar phase diagram to the high TC cuprates so that the system get, gets superconductor near, in fact, a phase that has some, some, some magnetic long-range order, and this superconductivity is obtained, in this case, by doping. Um, but, as you see also, neither copper nor oxygen are here now the main players for these materials. It's iron and these uh, nictites, or as we will also see, calcogenites. So, soon after this discovery, there were, of course, many other families of iron-based superconductors found, like um, here the case of barium, iron-2, arsenic-2. These are called the 1-2-2 materials. And um, one, could one can see that these materials, again, show a very similar phase diagram. There is, um, for the on the case, a region where the system shows a spin density wave, long range of the spin density wave. And by doping the system, different kinds of doping, then you observe this superconducting dome. This superconductivity can also be obtained by taking the parent compound and just putting the system on the pressure. So we have now a series of new materials, and of course, as usual as theoretical physicists, we would like 
to get the universality of this class of materials. So ca what can you say, what can we say about this new class of superconductors being universal and being non-universal? What is uni universal about these materials, and it's again different from the cuprates, is that here we are dealing with multi-orbital systems. So in the cuprates we have this nice dx squared minus y squared copper band, and um, we have been living for many years with the uh, at the model level with a one-band Hubbard model, now we are here faced with a um, multi-band system and we have to take care of all these, of the physics um, coming out of these multi-bands. A second issue that was um, at the very beginning very much discussed is that if we just look at the band structure of these materials, most of them they show uh, nesting features. Uh, we, and of course this spin density wave can be in a naive way explained uh, as be originating from um, nesting effects. Uh, we will see that in fact there are new classes of materials that they don't show nesting properties and therefore the issue about nesting has been now um, changing how important is this nesting for superconductivity and for magnetism in these materials. And the third non-universal feature in these materials is in fact the symmetry of the superconducting order parameter. So in the high TC cuprates, we have these materials are D-wave superconductors. Here, um, there are materials where one finds no nodes. They are S-wave, extended S-wave. Uh, some other materials one finds nodes in the symmetry of the order parameter. So one has been discussing D-wave superconduct superconductivity. Even recently, for instance, in the framework of the potassium iron to arsenic to, so there is now a discussion whether on the pressure the system changes also the symmetry of the order parameter. So there is definitely not a universal behavior uh, regarding the superconducting order parameter. So here I'm just showing some of the families that have been uh, discovered and up to now, as far as I know, maybe you know new results, but as far as I know, this is the maximal critical temperature that has been reached, 55 Ks, um, in this samarium oxy oxygen iron um, arsenic by doping the system. And um, of course, as usual, as it happened also with the cuprates, the question is how can we describe now the behavior of these materials? Are these materials in fact more belonging to the itinerant regime or to the localized regime? Um, after all, we have here correlated metals, and the question how I describe the correlated metal, sh should I start from the very localized um, um, limit, or should I uh, start from the itinerant limit and then include correlations? And we have seen um, in the introductory talks of um, Antoine George that in principle, a method that has been shown to be very successful to describe correlated metals is uh, dynamical mean field theory. And what I'm going to uh, show here is that when we consider uh, LDA, so DF, density functional theory in combination with dynamical mean field theory, we can understand quite a few features of the um, properties of these materials. So I will concentrate here on the 111 systems. These materials, in fact, they don't show this phase of, um, B, of uh, a magnetic order. So uh, by lowering the temperature on these parent compounds, these materials get superconductors um, at reasonable temperatures. And what I want to show in these materials is, in fact, the importance of correlations in order to understand um, RPs, so photoemission experiments, and the hasman alkin experiments. And in fact, in, in this context, recently there was the synthesis of these materials, magnesium, iron, germanium, which is isoelectronic and um, is a structural to lithium iron arsenic. It shows almost identical band structure to this material, but it's not superconductor. And the question is, why is this material not superconductor? Um, if at least at the DFT level, these two materials have the same uh, behavior. So I'm going to um, discuss on that. And if I have time, I will then um, here discuss the effects of pressure and how correlations change as a function of pressure in the example of the calcium 1 to 2 material. So um, I don't need to introduce, uh, introduce LDA plus DMFT. We had a very nice introduction this morning that we can um, please the local 
uh, correlations, the local fluctuations are exactly described by the dynamical Milfield theory, and this already is giving a very good description of band randomizations and how these band randomizations are happening in these materials and a few other issues as um, Antoine has been explained this morning. So let me start with this lithium iron arsenic. And let me tell you also the reason why we started investigating this material. It all came uh, a couple of years ago when there was a strong discussion between the people that were doing um, photoemission experiments, so ARPIS, Borisenko, uh, Bernd Dushina and collaborators, and the people that were measuring the Hasfan Alphen. So um, this is the group of Carrington and Amalia Coldea, and the results were the following. So Borisenko was seeing the following. So what I'm showing here is a cut, a KZ equals zero cut of the Fermi surface uh, in this material where we show here it's the gamma point, and we have uh, around this gamma point whole pockets, and here is the end point where we have electron pockets. This is a typical um, KZ Fermi surface behavior in these iron-based superconductors. Now what Borisenko observed or found is that here these uh, hole pockets near the gamma point are extremely strong compared to if you do a LDA or DFT calculation so that we have here that there is no, not at all nesting with, uh, with you, which you should have if you do, or which you observe if you do the LDA calculation. Um, on the other side, and at the same time, so the Hasfan Alphen was, in fact, by, by interpreting the Hasfan Alphen um, frequencies and building them up into, uh, uh, into these Fermi surfaces, the Hasfan Alphen was, find it, was found, uh, found that if you just do the LDA calculation, you can exactly reproduce the Hasfan Alphen effects. So, therefore, from the Hasfan Alphen, which measures the extremal orbits in these materials, and in principle, it's a bulk measurement. Um, you could say that in this system, correlations are not that important, and at the level of the DFT, you can explain the behavior of this material. And what I'm showing here is this KZ uh, equals zero cut, where I superimpose basically what I have at the gamma point, which is uh, the pockets at the gamma point, which is these red dashed uh, uh, circles, and superimposed to the endpoints to see a little bit these nesting features. And this is the same for the KZ point. So therefore, here there is an inconsistency between these two, um, these two measurements, and the question is, where does this inconsistency come from? So um, again, as these materials, even if they may not be strongly correlated, they are correlated metals, Let's, in fact, introduce now the effect of correlation by considering LDA plus the MFT. And what uh, we did is um, basically the LDA, we do LDA by considering bin 2 k so the linear augmented plane wave projectors, uh, sorry, the linear augmented plane bases. Uh, and of course, one of the developers of bin 2 k is here, Peter Blacha. And in, if we want to do this coupling of the density functional theory results with uh, dynamical mean field theory, what we need, we need to do a conversion from the block functions, which is the basis in a typical DFT calculation, to localized wave functions, which are Vanier functions. So we need to do this conversion. And the way we do this conversion here is by considering the projector method, which was proposed by, by Marcus Eichhorn, uh, by um, uh, jo Antoine and also by Silke and collaborators. And then once we have these Vanier functions, we can then uh, do the, the DMFT self-consistency. We can do it charge full, by considering full charge calculations. That means one step DFT, one step DMFT until we have this full self-consistency. And we used as impurity solver the continuous time quantum Monte Carlo. And here I'm, I'm showing now the results for a set of values. So we chose U equal 4 electron volts and J, uh, the Huns coupling 0.8 electron volts. And I will show you later on the sensitivity of the results to changing these parameters. So what I'm showing here now is the band structure. So the red is the band structure obtained by LDA 
where I already have uh, considered uh, a scaling factor of 2.17. And um, in dark, these shadows are the LDA plus the MFT results obtained by doing this full sharp cell consistency. And what we observe is that there is, in fact, a selective band renormalization, so different bands different orbital characters renormalize differently. So the DXY is the mostly localized orbital, so therefore it has a larger band renormalization. And um, here are the other orbitals which have um, considerable band renormalization. So what is important, the difference between just taking a DFT and just shrinking by a, a given factor, which is what many photoemission people do in order to sort of get these correlations, is that when you do it, the calculation properly by uh, including in, in the dynamical mean field theory, then of course you get the correct information about how this renormalization is in fact orbital dependent. And what I'm showing here is basically the, yes, sorry. Is this the model for the, uh, sorry? Is this the model for the, the no, the Kanamori model, what do you mean? No, this is, Oh, the orbital that I call it is a dxy orbital in the basis where I take that the x and the y is, so it's the nearest neighbor iron, I put the x axis. So it's 45 degree rotated with respect to the crystallographic axis. So this is the dxy, which is the one which is pointing to the arsenic iron. And this dxy, because you have the direct iron-iron uh, coupling, and of course the coupling through the arsenic, what it happens is, is that these two um, sort of, one frustrates the other one, and this orbital is then very localized. So this is the way to understand why this one is more. So the number of, or, thank you. So the number of correlated orbitals that I take here is I only take the iron, um, basically the iron D5 orbitals. These are the only bands that I consider as in correlation and all others I don't consider the effect of correlation. So this is the, win the window that I take, it's, it's between uh, minus five and five. I, does this answer your question? So now what do we observe when we do this material? So now I, do, I show this cut on the Fermi surface this is the LDA results in the, um, the KZ equals zero plane, and these are the LDA plus the MFT results. And again, what we see here is that when comparing these two, um, at, so near the, uh, around the, these whole pockets around the gamma point, we see this shrinking of these inner whole pockets as was observed in um, the ARPES experiments. And of course, this shrinking is very much dependent on which parameters one considers, but in principle, what is important is that correlations, in fact, shrink these inner whole pockets as it is seen in ARPES. On the other side, if you observe what happens with uh, the electron pockets around the endpoint, they are almost n insensitive to this correlation effect. So they remain basically the same as in LDA. And this is now shown the KZ equal pi plane. And again, you see that there is almost no, there is no effect on the electron pockets, but there is this shrinking of the inner pockets, of the inner hole pockets around the Z point. So this is already giving us a hint of what could be different between the Hasman alpha measurements and the ARPES measurements. So what we did then is um, with our results from LDA plus the MFT, what we did is calculate the de Haas van Alphen frequencies, which what they do is they have half an Alphen frequencies. What I'm showing here is in fact um, the extremal sizes of the orbital, so the maximal and the minim, minimal uh, electron or hole uh, orbit as a function of the angle when I apply a magnetic field on the sample and I basically try to see which are the maximal and the minimal um, electron um, orbit uh, as a function of angle. So what we see here now, these are the experimental data. And in fact, in experiment, uh, and that's what Amalia told me, this is a problem of sample purity, they can only observe the electron pockets. 
So they cannot observe the whole pockets. They on, only observe the electron orbits. So basically what they are observing, I'm showing it here, is the features of these uh, electron bands, the these four and five. So this is the band five. So these points here, in fact, belong to this blue. This would be the, ma the minimal orbit, and this would be the size of the maximal orbit. And, f and, and then the, the four one, this would be the minimal orbit, and this is the maximal orbit. And these are the, these data belong to the uh, yellow one, and these are the data belong to the blue one. So now when you do the LDA plus the MFT, what we see is that these, uh, as we saw already in the Fermi surface, these electron pockets, they don't change. They are not affected by correlations. And that's why, in fact, the husband often agrees very well with LDA, because this is not affected by correlations. What is affected by correlations are these band one to three, as you see that they suffer some shifts. Um, and this is, in fact, the source of the discrepancy between the Hasfan alphen and uh, photoemission. The Hasfan alphen was only measuring the electron pockets, and the electron pockets definitely are not affected by correlations, while ARPIS was, in fact, pointing at the effects at the gamma point, which are the whole pockets. And the whole pockets, they do get, in fact, shrunk by correlations effect. So now, of course, the question is, we chose, sorry, Yes. So why actually? Is there any, I mean, simple way to understand why, I mean, your only whole pockets are getting affected by correlation, not the electron? Yes, you can, um, so maybe if I show that here in the band structure. So you see, this is the, this is the gamma point, and this is, these are the, this is these um, whole pockets at the gamma point, and then I'm showing here um, the electron pockets at the end point, so what we have here is this, the effect on these ones, which is mostly this DXY and the Z1. So we have here um, that they are so, so uh, the bending on, of this is so um, near the Fermi level that very different effects of the mass renormalization is going to then affect the cutting at the Fermi level very strongly. While this is not the case here, as you see, it's much um, further from the Fermi level, basically this crossing. So now, uh, of course, the, you could ask, well, you chose now here a J and a U. We didn't calculate, uh, in principle, these parameters, so we just chose a set. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted um, to understand which is in fact, how the changes of U and J affect the parameters in these uh, materials. And here what I'm showing is basically this KZ equals zero Fermi surface for, by just keeping the same J and changing the value of U. And you see, and here I'm showing two values, but we did a series of them. Basically, this uh, is almost not modified. So there is very little changes by just doing different U values. But where one sees really, where, where the system is very sensitive is to the value of J, to the Huns coupling value. So if you just consider a larger uh, Huns coupling, then of course this shrinking is going to be much larger. So this is also, um, in fact, this kind of uh, discussion this morning, um, Antoine was discussing that on the, in the context of other materials. And there has been also some work up, uh, from Christian and, and Gabi uh, discussing the importance of J in these multi-orbital systems. And here we can see it again that by keeping, by fixing U and changing J, we have uh, strong effects on the variation of the effective mass in this material. So it is a high sensitivity um, of the electronic properties of these materials on the Huns coupling. Yes. Yeah. So the, the question is, which is more important, the J-induced crystal field splitting between the orbitals or the difference in mass? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. But I, um, the issue is to, do, to, sh to see this effect, uh, the change in crystal field splitting. We should, uh, the best way would be to do a, um, basically a lattice relaxation to see, in fact, how the crystal fields adapt to these values, and we, these we haven't done that. But just the, the value, the, the difference in value of the cell's energy at, at the chemical potential. 
Oh, this is my, co yes, sorry, yes, you're right. So I misunderstood you, yes. Um, so in this, I don't have here the, I don't have here the, um, the only picture that I can show you is, but the, I don't have here the, 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 you want to see in fact how the self energy, um, I don't have here the pictures, but. Actually, sorry, I have a. That's, that's not that important, at least from the results that I have in, that I remember, it's not that important. So it's you say the mass change is, you say the mass change is more important. The mass change is at least from, in this material, so I cannot just say it in general, but in this material, what we see is that the mass changes are more important than this shifting. I see, thank you. Excuse me, um, I may have misunderstood something, but I thought your pocket sh uh, renormalization is precisely that transfer of charge from one orbital to the other. Isn't that the effect that Andy's asking for? Is I think his question is more simple, right? You are, you are asking, in fact, Okay, so let's, maybe I misunderstood your question then. Let's discuss that, okay. Um, so then what we did is, let's go now to, yes, let's go now to um, another class. So basically, the, these materials that belong to the same class of um, <coughs> superconductors, but where we change basically our arsenic by phosphor. So in this case, these materials, the, the lithium iron phosphor is also superconductor but at much lower temperature. And in fact, in this, this material shows a nodal superconductivity in contrast to lithium iron arsenic, which is uh, in fact a non-nodal superconductivity. And the same is the case for this 111 system, which is also uh, non-magnetic and by lowering the temperature at these low temperatures, it also shows nodal superconductivity. So can we understand the fact that uh, the lithium iron arsenic is non-nodal and this one is nodal? And when we do this investigation with LDA plus the MFT, so we try to um, understand how correlations affect this material by doing the same procedure as we did previously with the uh, lithium iron arsenic, what we see is that there is in fact um, in this material a change of topology and I should say with that it's very important for these materials to do the full charge self-consistency because other ones, otherwise one runs into problem uh, when you have uh, the correlated bands and the bands that you are not treating with correlation very near the Fermi surface. So one has to do then a full self-consistent uh, calculation. And what we see here in fact that, and let me maybe concentrate on this material, uh, no, in fact, both of them show that, that there is um, this band here that with correlations gets exactly at the Fermi level. And this has important consequences for this lanthanum iron uh, phosphor oxygen on the appearance of this extra hole pocket around the gamma point, which is not there when you do an LDA calculation. And there are some ARPES experiments by uh, Luan collaboration and collaborators where they show in fact, um, they see with ARPES the, the presence of this um, outer hole pocket. And at the time when they did the experiments, they were not sure where this could come from since DFT doesn't show this band. And they were saying that maybe whether their samples maybe could have some kind of charge deficiency that this, this uh, pocket was showing. So in, in principle, what we see here is that correlations could be the reason for the presence of this um, of this um, whole pocket, which is in fact of the z square character. And the same is happening for the lithium iron phosphor, uh, iron phosphor where this um, whole pocket is appearing around the z point. So this of course has consequences also on the, the Hasman alpha uh, results and so that you don't have much time. Maybe I would come to this, um, to this discussion about nodal or nodal superconductivity. So if we sort of accept that um, the superconductivity in these materials is driven by spin fluctuations, um, we could at least consider now either functional RG or uh, RPA spin fluctuations kind of calculations. So in, this, in these approaches, what they observe is that in fact, if there is um, 
a whole pocket of different symmetry, like in the, in the case that it's happening in these materials, that this is squared, this might promote a nodal gap and very weak pairing strength, so very low temperatures, and this is what is observed in this material. So in this context of uh, weak coupling, uh, we could uh, explain why uh, these materials show nodal superconductivity at low temperatures. And since my time, I think it's almost over, let me just maybe as, as um, a question of, do I have two minutes? As a question of um, basically discussing uh, a new material that is very similar to lithium iron arsenic, but is not superconductor. So now uh, the same, so Hosono and collaborators just recently considered, so synthesized the following material. They substituted all arsenics by germanium and lithium by magnesium, and then you get this magnesium iron germanium system. So this system is isostructural, isoelectronic uh, to lithium iron arsenic. It has a very, very similar Fermi surface, but it's non superconductor. So if you do a, a, a plain, um, uh, a plain, uh, Pin, so RPA calculation, then you would say um, there is some, some inconsistency between these two systems because you should get very similar results. So where is, where is the clue here? So uh, is, uh, the, are these theories wrong? Uh, or uh, is there something that we missed here in this material? So what we did is um, there is one issue about doing density functional theory calculations, so non-spin polarized density functional theory calculations. And the issue is that when one does a non-magnetic calculation, which is the usual uh, calculations that one does to obtain this uh, band structure uh, results, uh, basically you are not treating a paramagnetic system. You are doing a non-magnetic calculation, so the magnetic moment is not there. So the question is, we should in fact look at instabilities of the system by doing magnetic calculations. So even though that the, these materials are not showing a long range uh, magnetic phase, nevertheless, we, sh we um, should look for possible instabilities by doing um, different um, uh, spin dependent density functional theory calculations. And what one observes is, in fact, that um, this magnesium iron germanium strongly favors ferromagnetism, while lithium iron arsenic favors stripe order. So in this, and here, for instance, there's a calculation of the density of states in the ferromagnetic state and here in the striped state. And we see that in the ferromagnetic state, magnesium iron germanic is more stable if we use now uh, basically basic uh, DFT arguments, uh, while in the stripe or the lithium iron arsenic is um, in fact more stable and one can see also by the total energy calculations. So one um, way of answering this question why one material is superconductor and the other is not, at least already at the level of DFT, is basically that the magnesium iron germanium uh, is very near to a ferromagnetic instability um, while uh, lithium iron arsenic is favors the stripe order that has been seen, uh, in fact, realized in other iron nictites. And therefore, if, the if this system is, pr is proximal to a ferromagnetic instability, um, these fluctuations at Q equals zero are going to be stronger than the fluctuations at, at pi pi, and this may destroy a possible um, pairing, and this may destroy superconductivity, and one can explain the absence of, of superconductivity in this material. Now, very recently, um, uh, Zing, um, Christian Haule, and Antoine Jo, uh, no, Antoine no, was not involved. It was Gabi who was involved in the calculation. Uh, what they did is um, they calculated S of Q on omega for a series of uh, different iron-based superconductors and also for this magnesium iron germanium. And they see when they calculate uh, S of Q on omega by um, also considering the, um, the pair vertex with, different with various approximations, they find in, indeed this uh, strong ferromagnetic instability in this material. So I guess my, my time is over, so I'm going to skip the results on the pressure, and I would conclude then that uh, in lithium iron arsenic, 
uh, I, I showed that the correlations strongly affect the whole pockets while the electron pockets remain unaltered. And this, therefore, is in agreement with both ARPES and the husband alphan experiments. And we see the sensitivity to Hund's coupling that we can discuss um, further about it. And uh, the phosphor materials, the, one finds that correlations, in fact, induce a whole pocket of um, DZ square character. And this could be um, an explanation for the appearance of nodal superconductivity in this material. And finally, magnesium, iron, germanium. This system is not superconductive due to the proximity to a ferromagnetic instability. And I have a summary too. So um, these calculations, of course, um, they, they are very helpful to understand these materials. But one should uh, bear in mind that we have sensitivity to very different issues. Uh, to the choice of impurity solver, the analytic continuation. And uh, as Antoine was saying this morning, it's, it's very good that there are such impurity solvers like the continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, which allow us to at least um, get more, so at least explore more and more a few features of these materials. There is a, a large sensitivity on the, uh, on the values of the parameters that enter. And I didn't go into dynamic, and so what, uh, in fact, Ferdi and Zilka are doing. This is uh, another issue that one should, in fact, explore. Uh, one should also be careful about the double counting procedure, how to treat correlated versus non-correlated bonds, to do full self ch charge self-consistency. And it would be very interesting to, to go into this uh, more near. So other, other properties, uh, not only the spectral functions, and uh, uh, finally, that this materials are an important playground for exploration. And I thank you for your attention. So we have time for a few quick questions. Uh, I think I just missed the numbers. But if you go back to this magnesium compound, uh, you said you compared different ground states. Yes. Uh, which one is now the most stable one, the ferromagnetic? But what is the non-magnetic? So the ferromagnetic is lower in total energy than yes, the non exactly. So DFT says the ground state is ferromagnetic. Exactly. That's what OK, then in that sense, DFT does not reproduce the true ground state that's, that's realized in, well, in the experiment. Because in the, yeah, other, yeah, in experiment, in the other nictites, it's always quite fine. You know, for the ones who get the right. stripe, it's, it's a stripe. When you get the yes. checkerboard, it's a checkerboard, and so on. Right. So, so the, exactly. So that, that is, that's, that's one of the issues. That's why when you start with these materials, so both lithium iron arsenic and uh, uh, magnesium iron germanium, when you start with this, you say in experiment they never order. Therefore, the first thing you would do is a non-magnetic a non calculation. But the question is that these systems have a magnetic moment, a fluctuating magnetic moment. So, and we know that DFT has a lot of problems in describe, cannot describe fluctuations. Nevertheless, what is the underlying so I would say the underlying instability, even though the system doesn't order, the underlying instability. And this is what we try to look in with this calculation. But the Fermi surfaces look very similar, right? The Fermi surface, these are the non-magnetic Fermi surface, look very similar. OK, I'm done. Yeah. There are just a few questions which we didn't have time because of the pressure. Uh, yes. Uh, how does the spin density wave uh, temperature depends on pressure in these systems? Um, the speed, yeah. So the the so are you asking about whether it goes up or down? That's what I'm asking. On the pressure, it goes down. The you mean the temperature, the TC goes down? No, not TC. The the SDW. The order. The, yes. The, the order. order. The from so the parent compound. From the parent compound. So the magnetic order disappears, and depending on which material. It is, a, for instance, in this calcium, let me show you that. Oh, sorry, the calcium one to two. So it, this depends on the material here. Okay. Tuck. So in this material, it goes, so you see that the spin density wave remains up to a certain pressure, which, yeah. uh, if I don't remember wrong, is 0 0.3 gigapascals. And then suddenly, it does almost like a first order phase transition. For barium one to two, it's much more smooth. But in both cases, it goes down. But in both cases, it goes down. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Which supports the view that it's a uh, neutron anti-ferromagnet. Yes. 